Cologne Cathedral, a UNESCO World Heritage Site that draws thousands of visitors a day. Its magnetic appeal extends well beyond the city that surrounds it. The cathedral is brimming with priceless art and cultural treasures and inspires awe and admiration. And yet, it is a vulnerable colossus. The cathedral is a long-term construction site. Scaffolding seems to be a permanent fixture. Cathedral architect Peter Fissenich and his team are responsible for securing and preserving the gigantic structure. Weather and air pollution take their toll. The maintenance bill runs to around 20,000 euros a day. The stone here is much yellower than it is up there. The cathedral itself tells us what needs to be done. We basically just set priorities and do the work. Right now, Fussenich is planning projects that will not be carried out for another 50 years. It's a big responsibility, and we need to approach our work with a bit of humility. That's because we can complete just a fraction of the work that needs to be done. When the cathedral doors are locked at the end of the day, it's peaceful and quiet once again, for at least a few hours. Custodians clean up after the day's visitors, and they check to make sure that everyone has left the building. Through the centuries, many have sought to exploit the cathedral for their own ends. Kings, emperors and cardinals. The cathedral seemed to inspire a sense of greed in these people, and not just because of its treasures. There are lots of people who protect the cathedral, and very few that we need to protect the cathedral from. Cologne Cathedral is a world unto itself, and the master of that world is Provost Gerd Bachner. Nothing takes place here without his permission. But Bachner's jurisdiction is limited. Everything that goes on outside the building, for example, on the Dornplatte or Cathedral Square, is a matter for the city of Cologne. The Domplatte is a crazy place. There's a lot going on here. And on a Saturday like today, it's really busy. 20,000 people a day visit the cathedral. It's the most visited place in Germany. Angela Schlösser has worked as a guide at the cathedral for more than 20 years. When I started doing guided tours, we just walked into the cathedral and looked around. It was all very casual, not like it is today. Later, they decided to regulate the flow of visitors. That makes sense. So now only 10 groups an hour are allowed. That helps people get more out of the tour. If people were just herded through the place, like they are at Versailles, they wouldn't enjoy the experience. And it wouldn't do justice to the cathedral either. Filming in the cathedral is strictly forbidden. This is a place of worship after all, and church officials want to maintain the cathedral's dignity and integrity. Still, visitors do take photos and videos for their own private use to show the folks back home that they were actually here. But the 20,000 visitors a day do have an impact. They throw used chewing gum on the floor, scribble on the walls and leave behind a mixture of fabric fibres and particles that they've exhaled. All this creates problems for the cathedral. 
You've got all these people moving through the building, and those particles settle on the artworks. So we work constantly to limit the damage. But we also want to make sure that the building remains open to a large number of visitors. That includes the faithful. Up to six masses a day are held here. These services provide brief respites between the waves of tourists. Many of them don't show proper respect. Right now we have a problem with Pokemon players. We've actually seen them leaping over pews. I'm not a very religious person myself, but I still find it annoying. It's disrespectful. Cologne Cathedral is a remarkable achievement. It took centuries to build, and people should respect that. The security staff are responsible for keeping things under control, but who decides how the cathedral's public image should best be preserved? That's an issue that has long concerned writer and cabaret artist Martin Stankowski. He's lived in Cologne for decades. The Cathedral Advisory Board claimed that they have the authority to interpret that, but that's not correct. The board does represent the religious side of things, but there are also artistic and political considerations, and all sides have a legitimate claim when it comes to making decisions on those various issues. The distinctive silhouette towers over Cologne's post-war concrete landscape from every direction, the cathedral dominates the skyline, an imposing landmark at the heart of the city. All sorts of things are marketed under its name, including cookies and beer. It's not a registered trademark. Unfortunately, there's no legal obstacle to people using the word cathedral. But on the bright side, the fact that manufacturers seek to associate their products with the cathedral shows that it's regarded as a valuable commodity. But for the provost, the cathedral is first and foremost a church. His favorite spot is halfway along the choir section. It's a place that gives him strength, a place where he can pause and reflect. Regardless of whether you're religious, you can answer the life's important questions only if you can step back from the hustle and bustle and find a quiet spot. And you can do that in a sacred place like this. The cathedral has an inner radiance that draws people to it. But there is also a hidden side to the cathedral. Deep down below the nave, you can see the medieval foundations and traces of 2,000 years of history. They bear witness to the colorful past of this city and its people. We found Roman residences on the cathedral site and a Roman floor heating system. There are living rooms that have painted walls. We've also found old churches. This is basically the nucleus of the present-day cathedral. This passageway leads to an area that's closed to the public. This was once the villa district of ancient Colonia, the foundation on which the modern-day cathedral was built. Some think this is where early Christians met in private residences to pray and hold religious services. And it's amazing. You can still see the site of the altar. These are the foundations of the present-day Gothic high altar of Cologne Cathedral. The cathedral's inner sanctum. Long before the Gothic edifice was completed, people made pilgrimages here to see Cologne's greatest treasure. 
That cathedral was built to house the shrine, and the shrine was created to store the mortal remains of the three kings, the Magi. The earlier cathedral, a Romanesque church, is where the relics were first kept when they were brought here from Italy. The relics were in Milan, and Cologne's archbishop saw his chance and took it. He pocketed the relics. No one here complained. He turned Cologne into a major pilgrimage center. It was a lucrative business model for the church and for the city. Cologne ended up becoming the biggest medieval city north of the Alps. Cologne's reputation as a commercial center, a cultural center, and a transport hub extended far beyond the Rhineland. And of course, the city needed a church, a state-of-the-art religious landmark, to emphasize its stature. At the time, the pyramids at Giza in Egypt were the world's largest structures. But in the 13th century, the title passed to Cologne's cathedral. Skilled labor from all over Europe took part in its construction. Those early cathedral builders did an incredible job. They were the first people to lay the foundations for a building that they would never see completed. And they knew it. The foundation pit was 17 meters deep. There is as much masonry down here as there is above ground. Today, a structural engineer would say that this is way over the top. The foundations don't need to be this big. But it also means that we don't need to worry if there's an earthquake. And this is the most earthquake-prone region in Germany. Two types of rock were used to make the foundations. Hard black basalt and a casing of softer rock made of volcanic ash to cushion earth tremors. The structural solution for the high-vaulted ceilings is equally ingenious. Without the buttresses, the window walls would lack the necessary stability. The area around the altar is supported by numerous arms. This creates a solid structure that is nevertheless airy and weightless. It's protected like a castle by crenellations and turrets, Yet, it is still light and transparent. A medieval marvel erected in just 70 years. Imagine that you're living in the Middle Ages, in a small half-timbered house. Cologne was a city of half-timbered houses. A stone house was a luxury. Your windows would have been about this big. But what was in the windows, not glass, it was animal hide or oil-soaked cloth. And when it was cold in winter, the shutters were closed. So that's your home. And then imagine yourself a pious medieval Catholic stepping into the cathedral. This was the view that presented itself to pilgrims for centuries. The oldest window in the cathedral dates from 1260. Sunlight makes the colors so intense and luminous that many at the time thought that the glass panes were precious stones. But people didn't come to the cathedral just to see the windows. People made pilgrimages to the gold shrine that held relics of the Magi. It didn't matter what was inside. The main thing was that people came. They stayed overnight, did some shopping, bought some presents, perhaps paid a visit to a brothel, and then went home. But the cathedral was far from finished. After the area around the altar was completed, the aisles and parts of the South Tower were built. But then, construction came to a halt for hundreds of years. In the 16th century, Cologne was in economic decline. Martin Luther had arrived on the scene, so indulgences were getting harder to sell. Gothic architecture was now well and truly passé. 
The old building crane was left at the top of the unfinished tower, and it stayed there, squeaking and creaking for 300 years. I think that living with a stopgap solution, this unfinished project, played an important role in shaping the mentality of the people here. Cologne is not a particularly beautiful city, nor is it a world beater, but it's brilliant at being second rate. So where does that ability to live with second best come from? I think it may have to do with the fact that its most important building was never finished, but was always still functional. The people of Cologne didn't mind having a half-finished cathedral. The structure fell into disrepair. Under Napoleon, French troops occupied the city. The archdiocese was dissolved and the cathedral became an ordinary parish church. For the Catholics, of course, that was a bitter pill to swallow. Their church had been taken away from them. It was now a military barracks and it was in a dreadful state. That was the lowest point in the cathedral's history. The French even used part of the structure as a stable. During that period, the medieval archive was also lost. Even today, we don't know if it still exists, or if it does, where it might be. The blueprint, known as Facade Elevation F, also disappeared at that time. Facade Elevation F is an original medieval drawing of the West Portal, the blueprint of the cathedral. The story of Elevation F is quite incredible. It's four meters high, drawn in ink on parchment, and was rediscovered in the mid-19th century. Half of it turned up in Paris. It was found among a job lot of architectural drawings that was bought by a collector who had a special interest in Cologne Cathedral. But the crucial left half was missing. Then a drawing was found in the attic of a tavern in Darmstadt, and it proved a perfect match for the other half. Someone had been drying beans on it. That was lucky, because otherwise it might have been thrown away and lost forever. The drawing showed precisely what the cathedral was originally intended to look like. After the 300-year break, the Prussians resumed construction. Around the site, entire streets of houses were demolished to maximize the majestic building's visual impact. A new square was created, and it quickly drew crowds of local residents. The square is really popular. And at the same time, it's a local landmark, so people are always reinterpreting it and using it to promote their own interests. But I think the square is more than just a stage. The city permits six major events a year to be held outside the cathedral, but these events must be compatible with the dignity of the church. Whether that criterion is met by every street artist is debatable. Some musicians show up with amplifiers and play or sing the same song ten times a day. You can hear it in the confessionals where people come to pray and reflect. That's really disruptive, no doubt about it. Speaking of disruptive, in the mid-1980s, the Cathedral Square became a rendezvous point for skateboarders from all over the country. Christian Schackert was one of them. There was a lot going on here and it was cool to be part of it. The backdrop was cool too, especially at night when the cathedral was lit up. That was special and it made you want to stay out there a while longer and skate. The debate went on for 20 years. Finally, the skateboarders had to move elsewhere. Some of them are still upset about that decision. 
It's purely subjective. Some people thought that we were violating the integrity of the cathedral. But how can you damage a cathedral's reputation? How can you do that by skateboarding? So what is acceptable and what isn't outside Cologne Cathedral? The debate about that is probably as old as the building itself and it continues today, fueled by the immediate proximity of the city's main railway station. No other European city has a cathedral right next to a railway station. You almost stumble into the cathedral when you leave the station. The cathedral's north door used to be open, and on a rainy morning, commuters used to take a shortcut through the church, so the cathedral board had the door locked. It was the Prussians who wanted the main railway station built right next to the cathedral. The idea was to create an impression of progress and modernity. steel bracing. The cathedral also has an iron roof truss, despite opposition from local traditionalists. It was used to preserve the cathedral's structural integrity. Steel helps protect against fire and woodworms. But more importantly, industrial age technology enabled the cathedral's construction to be swiftly completed at last. American engineers are said to have learned a lot here for later use in the construction of skyscrapers but it was the local population who benefited most. It was also a job creation scheme for Cologne workers. The cathedral was always a project by and for the local community. And in the 19th century especially, there was a very close connection between the community and the cathedral. When the cathedral was finished, it was the tallest building in the world, a powerful symbol, but there was a price to be paid. The Prussians used the cathedral to advance their own agenda. There was no more talk of the Magi. The cathedral was now a symbol of German national identity and, in particular, German unification. When the German Empire was founded in 1871, the Prussian emperor wanted to call the world's attention to the new nation, which extended as far west as the Rhineland. The Rhineland had been German territory since the Middle Ages, but was also claimed by France. The emperor needed a powerful symbol that represented German architecture and was located in the Rhineland. Cologne Cathedral fit the bill perfectly. So the cathedral construction project became a symbol of German nation building and therefore took on a new political significance. Even today, the cathedral often plays a symbolic role in various political efforts. Back in the 1960s, for example, Heinrich Böll, Günther Wallraff and others, including me, held a religious service to protest the death penalty in Spain. We went into the cathedral, said some prayers and held a kind of vigil. The vigil, led by Nobel laureate Heinrich Böll, made headlines. The tabloid press portrayed it as an occupation. If you hold a political event at a major location, it has a major impact. The cathedral has been the scene of numerous similar events since Böll's prayer for peace. The cathedral draws political activists like a magnet. When Josefina Witt visited the cathedral for the first time with her family, she could not know that she would one day stage a feminist protest there. We drove to Cologne, and as we got closer to the cathedral, we played a game to see who could spot it first. I won. I can still remember the overwhelming sight of it. You looked up and it seemed endlessly tall. It was breathtaking. A few years later, Witt was looking for a place to stage a protest against the oppression of women. 
We decided to hold the protest in a church, and Cologne Cathedral came to mind right away. Because it's so big, and because Cardinal Meissner was still in office. Cardinal Joachim Meissner, Archbishop of Cologne, known for his conservative views. Meissner's perception of women made him the perfect target for the feminists' protest. We had radical demands. These included the overthrow of the entire patriarchal system. And when a building ties patriarchal power so closely to a particular ideology, it's an obvious place to try to break that power, at least for a day or even for a brief moment. Christmas 2013. Protest and provocation in a sacred place on a sacred day. I was extremely nervous and excited. It was Christmas, and everyone was in a Christmassy mood, including me. It wasn't really a time for a protest. So it was a really big deal, and I knew it wasn't going to win me any friends. I didn't think it would escalate to the point of physical violence, but I was afraid that it might. Witt saw the protest as an act of free speech. There's a place for everything. People can demonstrate. But this is a place where others come to commune with God, find peace, pray and celebrate the liturgy. For their sake and for the sake of God's will, I am radically opposed to such protests. Josefina Witt was arrested, found guilty of gross interference with the exercise of religion and fined. Everyone okay? No cause for concern? Burkhard Jan has patrolled the cathedral square for 27 years. He likes his job, despite the rising threat level. Is this your backpack? Step closer, please. Terrorism is not a new problem. It's been around for a number of years, but we're still at risk, of course. Cologne is part of a danger zone that includes Germany and all of Europe. So what's the answer? Fences? More security personnel? The best protection would be for people to just leave the cathedral alone. It's a place of worship, a place for pilgrims and the community as a whole. Some people who walk past might have their doubts about the cathedral, but once they go inside, they almost always find it a moving experience. Since 2007, the magic of the cathedral has been enhanced by the new South Window, the work of Cologne artist Gerhard Richter. Archbishop Meissner thought the window was wholly unsuitable, but after lengthy debate, the will of the cathedral board prevailed. Today, it's hard to imagine the south transept without it. But where there is light, there is also shadow. On November 2, 1975, the cathedral treasury was robbed. Thieves got away with artworks worth several million dollars. The crime caused a sensation. There were appeals on TV for anyone who had information on the crime to come forward. The thieves gained access to the treasury through a ventilation shaft. The cathedral's chief custodian was appalled at the way the robbery was carried out. These people were not trying to steal art, just gold and precious stones. And they tore apart some extremely valuable items to get them. Yeah. 
senior public prosecutor, Maria Theresa Mersch, was in charge of the investigation. It was one of the most exciting cases of her career. On the night of the crime, some pedestrians saw two men climbing out of the cathedral. The witnesses gave chase. The perpetrators split up and the witnesses lost track of them. The witnesses went to the railway police and told them what they'd seen. But the railway police said it wasn't their responsibility. Amazing, but true. The next day, an artist who had a criminal record was identified as a prime suspect. The prosecutor immediately ordered a search of his apartment and the stolen treasure was indeed there, as investigators later discovered. There was a suitcase behind the door in the hallway. But before a proper search could be conducted, two more men turned up. They were later found to be accomplices. So two police officers had three men to keep an eye on. The suspect's wife then saw her chance. She said she felt ill, walked out the door and took the suitcase with her. She went down to the basement and put the bag in a neighbor's storage room. The suspect allowed police to search his apartment and cellar storage room. He knew that the bag was gone. As police closed in on the prime suspect, he fled to Belgrade. There, he persuaded a dental technician to melt down the gold. He did melt down some of the items, but others were so obviously valuable that he asked the suspect to spare them. But the suspect demanded that the precious stones be removed and the gold melted down. A private detective working undercover managed to track down the treasure. We recovered a lump of compressed metal, like a big salami. It was a heartbreaking sight. It took 10 years to reconstruct the damaged items. Theft is not the only problem that church officials have to worry about. There's also vandalism. The lighter spots up there are places that haven't been exposed to weathering. That's where it's been damaged by vandals. People climb up and use an umbrella to knock off a bit of a gargoyle or gable or pinnacle. We're very concerned about this. A stonemason might spend a year and a half working on a canopy. So it breaks your heart to see that work destroyed. It makes all of us angry, of course. So we're trying to find new ways to protect the cathedral. Since the wave of sexual assaults in Cologne on New Year's Eve 2015, there have been calls for tougher security measures at the cathedral. These include a fence around the entire building, like the one on the south side that stops people urinating on the wall. But many Cologne residents don't like the idea of putting barriers around their cathedral. When this incrustation and dirt are removed, you can see some beautiful workmanship, all the wonderful stone carvings and sculptures from the 19th century. These are real works of art, and they're being restored to their former glory. A conservator uses a laser to remove the dark dirt, and the light-coloured stone underneath remains intact. Afterward, the figures of the north portal seem brand new. But some of the sculptures still show signs of damage suffered during World War II. Some were defaced by bullets or shrapnel. 
the war posed the greatest threat to the cathedral in its entire history. By May 1945, Cologne had been almost completely destroyed, but one structure rose above the rubble, the cathedral, or what was left of it. A lot of Americans arrive here on the Rhine cruise ships and I take them on tours. They're convinced that the Allies did not intend to bomb the cathedral. But there's no credible evidence to back that up. From a distance, the cathedral seems unscathed. A lot of people believe that the cathedral came through the war without any major damage, but that's wrong. The fact of the matter is that the cathedral suffered serious damage during the war, not least because it was located next to the main railway station. The cathedral was hit by no less than 14 Allied bombs. Large parts of the roof of the nave collapsed. Much of the north transept lay in ruins, and the cathedral organ was destroyed. In autumn 1943, a bomb tore a massive hole in the north tower. There were concerns that the tower might collapse. So despite the wartime complications, the hole was bricked up, partly by forced laborers. After the war, Cologne was virtually unrecognizable. Only 40,000 people still lived among the ruins. Cologne, a proud city, and the oldest in Germany, was no more. But the fact that the cathedral was still standing may have given people hope. They saw that the cathedral had survived, and they might too. So they stayed put. The logical thing to do would be to leave. There was nothing left here. So I think the cathedral really did give strength and encouragement to the people of Cologne. In 1948, to mark the cathedral's 700th anniversary, a mass was celebrated in the chancel. The war damage in the North Tower has been repaired. You can recognize the temporary filling by its lighter color. That filling survived for decades, but it sparked an intense debate among preservationists. Some thought it should be removed. Others said it should be kept in place as a memorial to the war. It was decided that this scar should be removed, even if it meant erasing a highly visible reminder of the city's recent history. Personally, I would have favoured the other option, but you have to respect the opinions of those who were affected by those events. Still, you've got to explain to people what that white spot is. Perceptions of buildings are always changing, depending on how you explain the context. A refugee boat as an altar. In May 2016, Cardinal Rainer Maria Volki, Archbishop of Cologne, sparked vehement debate with this mass held to mark the Feast of Corpus Christi. The boat was later put on display in the cathedral, a reminder of the essence of the Christian message and a powerful political signal. The story made headlines around the world. On a human, religious and political level, I think it's brilliant that he used the cathedral in this way. A Corpus Christi procession featuring a boat from Lampedusa that saved refugees. So what sorts of activities are acceptable in the cathedral? There are lots of different answers. In summer 2016, Provost Gerd Bachner opened the doors to those who were attending the Cologne Computer Games Fair, Gamescom. There was electronic music, a light and laser show, and a party atmosphere. It put a new perspective on Cologne's largest structure.
I want to build bridges. Perhaps people can take away more from these events than they think. The idea was not just to address those who already have a close relationship with the church. It was designed to reach out to those who might have a problem with this God, this church and this faith. Cologne Cathedral, a place for everyone, even those who want to use it for their own purposes. But who owns it now? The city of Cologne, I hope. All the people of Cologne. I'd say it's owned by everyone who respects it and can feel its magic. And that can be anyone from anywhere. Cologne Cathedral belongs to the world. It doesn't belong to the archbishop or the archdiocese, as a lot of people think. The cathedral belongs to itself. And that's more than just a legal formula. The cathedral represents an obligation for the current generation and a gift to future generations.